Hi, today I'm speaking with Alexandra Clement. Alexandra is a grassroots environmentalist, founder of Endangered Rainforest Rescue, and a talented artist who makes beautiful furniture and sculpture from fallen trees. Together, we talk about her journey into conservation, about the importance of protecting Darien Gap in Panama for global biodiversity, and about reforesting an essential corridor that will protect many species, including the endangered jaguar. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it widely. Hi, Alex. It's really great to have you on Nature Solutionaries. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So over the past few years, I interviewed a number of conservationists, and I'm always curious about how they became conservationists. And many times they tell me things like, when I was young, my parents often took me to the zoo and I fell in love with animals and I wanted to protect nature. But your journey is pretty different. Um, it's quite unique and unusual, and I would like to hear more about it. So can you tell me what inspired you to become a conservationist? Absolutely. I mean, it definitely wasn't your typical uh, story of going to the zoo as a child, although I love the zoo. Um, it was uh, often, I'm told, a very random story uh, when I've spoken at schools I feel like people sometimes want a roadmap of how I got here as a conservationist and they hear my story and they're very confused. So I will try to give you the shortest version of a very long story. Um, it actually started out when I was in college. I was working for a marine construction company to pay for school. I was basically doing all of their accounting and secretary work, answering phones. And I noticed that in all of their government contracts to build bridges, docks, and piers throughout the New York, New Jersey, tri-state area was made um, from this one type of wood. So all of these docks were being built with this one material. And it was interesting to me um, that only one person sold it in the States. It was a very high priced item in the contracts. So I guess me being bored on the job, I just started to research this material. I found out that it came from South America. And I was so interested as to why it was being used in all of these contracts. Why were we using this wood from uh, South America? And it turned out that the reason that they used it was because it's some of the most dense wood in the world. So when you put it into the water, it doesn't rot, uh, termites can't penetrate it, and it lasts for a very long time. So I was 19 or 20 years old at the time, and I convinced the owner of the construction company um, to let me go on a trip to South America to try to find this wood with the intentions of just finding out more about this material and you know why they were using it so much from this place and was it ethical where was it coming from maybe i could buy it for them maybe it was a business opportunity i had no idea <laughs> and how did so, you convince the owner well you know? i mean i think um i think they saw they became interested in it cuz i was interested in it and they also saw an opportunity to possibly get this wood cheaper uh, if I could find out where it came from. You know, it was very up in the air. So, um, you know, it was, I mean, the the owner of the company was very open-minded and, and interested. So it worked out. And I booked a trip to Guyana, which is where most of the wood came from. And I was very young. I made a few contacts on the internet uh, that turned out to not be real. <laughs> um, but really what happened was I went down to South America for the first time and I was in the rainforest for the first time. And I fell in love with the beauty of this place. And I ended up falling in love with the wood, with the material. Um, I had seen some of it. It was construction material. So it wasn't even finished or anything like that. But there was something really special about this wood. So 
I um, decided after many different things happening on that trip, I remember coming home and I was thinking about um, how do I show people the feeling that I felt when I was in this place. And I ended up traveling back and I wanted to share that material somehow, but I knew cutting down trees was not a good way, right? Um, something felt wrong about that with the construction company as well. Like using this material, it, it clearly came from the forest. So I decided to spend several years of my life collecting fallen trees from the forest uh, with the help of different indigenous communities um, in South America. And when you and, say fallen, uh, does it mean that this is dead wood that's rotting or is it conserved? Well, I mean, so it, going back to what I said about the material, um, the durability of it, the wood doesn't really break down uh, very easily. So when it's in the forest, it's not really rotting. It's such a dense hardwood that it's not rotting. And most of the wood that I ended up collecting over many years um, was blocking packs pathways for indigenous communities throughout the jungle. So it was kind of always purposefully removed. Like it, they, they needed it moved anyway. So it was very exciting <laughs> um, to get rid of it in a sense um, because all wood has its purpose, right? Even the wood that falls in the forest uh, decomposes and that, that creates habitats for many different organisms. So um, I was only taking material that needed to be moved. And I'll, I'll just kind of throw in here too, At the time, I had no idea about sustainability being a hot topic, you know, nothing like that. This was all just feelings that I, I had. Um, and, and how many also, years is it? Yeah, how many years is it? I keep saying 15, but it's I'm old now, so it has to be longer than that. Okay. I think it was 17 years ago or something like something, something far away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, oh, but the years that I collected it, it took me like five or six, seven years to collect enough material to actually send back home. And the idea with all of this, I mean, I had, I didn't really know, but I knew I wanted to make something from the material and show it to the world. Um, and the idea too, with making something from this wood was an idea of sustainability because I knew how durable the material was, right? So if I were able to make furniture, um, I knew that that would last lifetimes, uh, that could be passed down something that would, you would never have to replace. So that was the only idea the whole time was sustainability. Um, so once I gathered enough of this material, I sent it back to New York, that story in itself, even just getting the material back was, um, a very long process, very difficult to break down those barriers. And then teaching myself how to work with some of the most dense wood in the world was also incredibly challenging. I mean, I used to drive the material to different wood shops, people who worked with wood for, for many years, and nobody wanted to work with this material because it was so dense. It would break all you the blades. You mean back in the U.S. Uh, already? At the U.S., yeah. So that was another big hurdle for me to, to teach myself how to work with this material. But I eventually turned this material into fine furniture and sculptural art to speak to the importance of the rainforest. So the whole journey was to make something to get people to care, like I said in the beginning. And I think I was pretty successful with that. Um, you know, my work got recognized and It was very, very intense work because it would take a very long time to make anything from this material. But um, I kept traveling down to South America and over the years, even after making pieces, I would just see that the rainforest was disappearing at such a rapid rate. And the material that I was using that I had become so intimate with from collecting it on the jungle floor to sculpting it with my hands back in New York, was at the threat of extinction. So it became very personal. And I decided that I would switch my expeditions from finding fallen trees um, for my artistic practice into finding seeds of endangered tree species for their reforestation. So that was how the journey switched into conservation. So it was a very um, real kind of feeling that came over me uh, to do that. 
And I decided to focus that work in the Darien Gap. Um, during all of this time, I had kind of moved over to Panama. Um, I really had fallen in love with the country and I had been researching the Darien Gap. This is a highly unexplored rainforest and a lot of the endangered tree species that I was looking for um, could actually still be found in the gap. So it, uh, it took me a long time to convince anyone to take me there, but that became where my heart was dedicated for conservation. Yeah, that's such an unusual journey. <laughs> very interesting, very inspiring. And it's good that you were able to combine it with, with artwork. Um, you know, everyone talks about uh, the Amazon rainforest or how the forests are disappearing or already disappeared in, in Borneo and uh, Sumatra. Why do you think that we should care about the um, about the Darien Gap or the Choco Darien region? Why is it so important uh, for the biodiversity? Yeah, there there's so many reasons why the Darien Darien region uh, and the rainforest is important there. And I would argue one of the most important rainforests to protect in the whole world that is often overlooked. Um, not to discredit any rainforest, we need all of it, but the Darien Gap has more biodiversity per square foot than the Amazon. No one talks about it. And from a geographical standpoint, it's super important for our global climate mitigation. So This rainforest, just to give you a little bit of historical history here, because I think it's fascinated. Uh, you used to have the continents of North America and South America were separated. And then over millions of years, um, the Darien Gap arose and connected those two continents for the first time. So it is literally the bridge of the Americas. And Panama as a country is the bridge, but the Darien is the is actually what connected those continents for the first time. So it's actually one of the newest formations on earth. And if you can imagine this landmass rising out of the ocean to connect these two major continents, that opened up migratory pathways for animal and plant species between North and South America for the first time. And this resulted in a plethora of end endemic species and species that could be found nowhere else in the world, of course, and then endangered species that are no longer found in many places. So it is a really special place. And it also has some of the highest carbon stocks in the world. So we are just not speaking about this enough. And what's really cool, I think, about protecting this area is when we think about the Amazon, it is so big. Right, it's in, and it's in, very difficult to protect such a large space. Um, but the Darien is rather tiny, right? But it has such a huge impact uh, locally and globally, and and for the Americas especially. So we can really protect this place. We can really safeguard it, and um, it's a tangible goal that people can actually wrap their heads around and and say, "Hey, if I'm a part of this." I actually protected this place. I'm actually saving the connection of the Americas. Yeah, you, you're totally right. Um, it, it reminds me of one of the interviews uh, which I did in the past about the Atlantic forest, which is also lesser known. You know, as I said, everyone talks about the Amazon rainforest. But when I interviewed the people from um, who are working to restore or reforest this Atlantic forest, they also told me that You know, it's it's geographically smaller, but uh, better managed than uh, the Amazon, which is huge, and it's it's really hard to monitor logging, etc. So I think it's pretty similar to Darien. And um, I was, I must confess that prior to this interview, I didn't know Darien Gap, so I was researching. And um, so the Choco Darien region stretches from uh, southwest Panama to northwest uh, Ecuador, and it's home to many spectacular species like jaguars, ocelot, uh, ant eaters, tamarines, and so on. And uh, the I was reading that the part in Panama, the Darien, has one of the richest uh, rainforests, uh, as you said, in Central. America, whereas the part in Colombia has these endemic plants. 
And I'm wondering, what are the most immediate threats that this ecosystem is facing these days? Yeah, um, it's it's rapid deforestation. So in Panama, it said that they've lost about 50% of their primary forest um, since the 1950s. It mostly happened in the western part of Panama, an area called the Azuero Peninsula, which is a drier forest to begin with, um, but that is where most of the cattle ranching took place. So that area I often point to as an example of what could happen to the Darien. Um, so they, there's been so much clearing of forests for cattle. And in the Azuero Peninsula, where these ranchers were, the soil was so depleted that they started to come to Darien because they just couldn't graze there anymore. So you'll see, you know, as the Pan American Highway was expanded down into the Darien Gap, you'll see like these kind of like veins of deforestation happening out from the side of the road. And the place where I've focused on is one of the biggest veins. It's like this huge cut into the forest. So as the weather warms as we deal with climate change, global warming, it's getting even hotter, it's getting more difficult for farmers and ranchers to have cattle, to have crops. And the Darien region is kind of the only place left where there is um, rich soil, where there's fresh land. So it's happening quickly. And um, also, I mean, it's not just cattle. I would say that's the that's the number one issue. But there's also issues with teak plantations. There's rice plantations. I mean, just agriculture in general um, and monocrop cultures. So um, you'll even see rapid deforestation still happening now, unfortunately. The neighboring Costa Rica is a pioneer in sustainability and really takes good care of its natural um, beauty. Um, is is the government of Panama thinking in the same way or is it does it have a little bit different strategy, you know, speaking when we are speaking about, you know, preserving this area? Do they want to preserve it and make use of it, for example, for ecotourism, or do they want to, you know, build more roads and more infrastructure and expand agriculture? Yeah, it's a it's a hard question to ask. I mean, there was a recent election in Panama. So I will start by saying that I am optimistic about the new administration with the environment. They seem to have their head in the right space. Um, and that's where it needs to be. However, historically, the government has not cared about the environment of Panama and it was very much focused, it seems to me, on the economy um, and, you know, developing. And we recently, back in October, there was a huge, huge protest against a Canadian mining company. One of the largest copper mines um, was operating under an unconstitutional contract in Panama. And in October, I was part of protest along with um, many environmentalists in Panama who actually got this contract shut down. So first quantum minerals, this mine, um, I mean, it's it's not completely shut down yet, but constitutionally it's been demanded to be closed. So it was a huge win, a huge environmental win for the people who fought. So it was a, an incredible fight. You actually had I think 250,000 people in the streets blocking the roads. You had indigenous communities on both sides of the Pan American Highway, which you know runs right through the whole country. That's the main road. So I think they were saying it cost the government 60 to 80 million dollars a day when these protests were going on. So it had a major impact. And this contract also, um, when they had re-signed it last year before the protest, it included permits for this company to do exploration into future mining sites, basically in every territory of Panama, including on indigenous land and on protected land in the area that I work now in Darien that would have been explored for mining, for more mining. So this was a huge win. Um, so I think this brought a new mindset to the Panamanian people as well, a new pride in keeping their 
country green. The slogans that kind of came out of that whole fight was um, keep Panama green, Panama's gold is green. Um, so it's really exciting to see this kind of shift and have this country realize that they can be more like Costa Rica. They don't have to just keep relying on development. Now, whether or not they do so, I think is yet to be seen. Again, I'm hopeful with this new um, government, with the new envir environmental group that works there, Miambiante, it seems like there's been a shift. Um, so I'm waiting to see. Okay, well, all of us are uh, keeping our fingers crossed for, for Panama. It's It's good to hear Finally, some good news, good environmental news, because that's rare. And what are the problems that the animals are facing as a result of this uh, fragmentation? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 very sad. I mean, you do have a huge area that is pretty intact, like I said, uh, compared to the rest of Panama. But there are those veins of deforestation that happen. And where we're working is one of the largest, like I said. And in this fragmented forest, you have, for example, the jaguar. I mean, I, I don't work with them directly, but there's been an organization that's been tracking them in the area that we work that's deforested. And they're walking a very thin line of forest between all the fragmentation. And they're a great example. Um, you know, I think the jaguar gets a lot of attention, but to me, it's just a sign, right? That there's all of these other species in the area. And what's happening is they're going into the deforestation where the cattle is and they're eating the cattle, right? They're not um, eating their natural prey. And this just creates um, a whole slew of problems for the whole ecosystem. Now they have the capybara, which used to be found in that area is gone. So now without the capybara, they're eating more cattle and the cycle just goes on. And this is happening with several different species. And what we see so often is that the loss of one species leads to the loss of many more. So that is why it's so important to take these fragmented patches of forest and build back forest to connect them again. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in this peninsula of deforestation. What's really beautiful about it is that we have intact protected indigenous land on three sides so the jaguar is walking in between through all of this deforestation and fragmented forest so our goal is to use the chukanake river which is the largest uh, river the longest river in panama and the most important runs right through that area and we are trying to gain all of that land that's deforested and forested and put back native forest in those deforested plots. So that will create a huge corridor for wildlife to go through the largest patch of deforestation in the Darien. Okay, and now tell me how exactly you reforest these areas. So my whole, um, going back to the beginning with the endangered tree species, my whole focus started with collecting the seeds of these trees, right? So over many years, I have set up nurseries and in indigenous communities where I bring the seeds from these endangered tree species. So I think what is unique about my organization is that we use endangered tree species as the backbone of building back an ecosystem, a native ecosystem. So we start with um, using these seeds. And then of course, in our nurseries, also growing other native species that uh, grow in the area. And we start to put back a natural forest. So, I mean, it's a, some, to some people it's boring, but you know, of course you start with pioneer trees, get the canopy up, and then you start planting all of the different trees that come along with it over the years. And what's really cool, I mean, is that because we're surrounded by, by this intact forest, natural regeneration happens quickly. Um, we have a lot of intact forest patches and then the, what that's surrounding it, natural regeneration is really possible. So it's a mix, right? But we don't wanna just have natural regeneration because unfortunately we don't have time, right? We need to get the canopy up. We need to get this tree cover. Um, like I said, the Darien region, this region in particular, this big patch of deforestation, um, that's a huge impact on, on our uh, carbon sequestration. So 
yes, a mix of natural regeneration and a careful growing of native forest. And how do you choose the places where you plant these trees? Do you buy land? And yes, do you? That is one of the most important pieces of this puzzle is buying land that's been depleted. So most of the land that we're looking to acquire to eventually put into a protected status is um, land that, that was used to graze cattle. So a lot of this land is, you know, completely cleared. And that's where we start to plant these trees. Okay, so it's a very similar model to, for example, um, the Atlantic rainforest or to the Choco region. Um, I um, I sometimes work with Saving Nature and they have partners around the world and they support NGOs which are doing a, a similar model just like you. And we're definitely going to speak about um, your cooperation with Saving Nature. So basically, if, if I get it right, um, you get funding from um, US or international donors. You go out in the field and you buy degraded land. You pick the um, seeds, then you grow the, the little saplings and, and trees in the nursery, and you go out and plant them with the indigenous people and the, the trees are growing and, and you are connecting these fragmented um, habit places, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I got it right. <laughs> and um, how many people work in your team? We have several different people that work at the nursery. So it's it's different areas, right? So a lot of these tree species, they're the endangered ones are found, you know, in the middle of the forest. So we have to go on pretty extensive journeys to gather the seeds. So the team is kind of spread out in different places. So we have you know, a couple of people, five or 10 people working at a nursery in one space, and then in another area, a few people, nursery managers. And then when we do seed collection, it's, it's like a whole community thing, where the whole community comes together, and we'll go collect seeds, or even during planting excursions, we have the whole community will come out and plant with us. So the team is always growing and, and changing during different moments. Um, which I found to be so beautiful because sometimes, you know, we'll have hundreds of, of seedlings to plant from the nursery out in these degraded areas. And we'll have, we'll start with like a small team, our, our usual crew. And over time, we'll be walking, you know, putting things in our back, putting seedlings in our back. And then all of a sudden, 20, 30 people will show up. Um, so, so oh, it's it's really beautiful and that that kind of spreads and it becomes a whole community project um, and then people start to take pride you know in that work because they're part of it. So you spoke about the fact that some of the areas have a special status that they are indigenous lands, right? Yes. So these are already protected, but the places which which are degraded were um, not. Um, indigenous lands or they had a different status or were they somehow stolen from the indigenous people or or how is it they were likely i mean just to be blunt they were definitely probably stolen <laughs> um <laughs> i think all of all of the land there has been but um how they decided this particular protection status i'm not sure but the land um particularly where we're working with our corridor the land in the center where that deforestation is happening is is not protected. So it wasn't legally, um, illegally encroached on. It was not protected, but only that surrounding area was. So you have about um, 5,000 hectares in the river corridor that we're trying to connect um, to indigenous land on both sides, if that makes sense. And then the whole entire area that's deforested, that peninsula is about 20,000 hectares. So it's a big patch that was unprotected, but it's so, it's so clear, right? When you look at a map and you see what's protected indigenous land and what's not, it's forest in the indigenous land and no forest <laughs> in the yeah. non-indigenous land. So we know so clearly that indigenous people are guardians of our forest. And how much land do you still want to buy and reforest so that you can create this, this corridor? So to create a connection. Um, the goal is about 5,000 hectares, even a little bit under that. 
But of course, you know, we're building, I, I know I keep using my hands, but it's, it's, it's very That's great. Nice. <laughs> um, you know, the, the river running through the center there, it's that chunk um, where 5,000 hectares would create a really nice buffer for the river um, and definitely be a beautiful, huge accomplishment. Now, of course, the deforestation is still happening on both other uh, the other sides of the river, right? So I want to keep building out that buffer zone. Um, and that is, you know, we'll go as much as we can. That's, you know, 10, 20,000 hectares on both sides. We're not going to, we don't need to do all of it, but I'll keep going for as long as I can. But the re real goal, and it would be such a beautiful accomplishment, would be that 5,000 hectares going across the river to connect to those two indigenous lands. And that is a huge impact if that could happen. I mean, you can see it on a map um, and it would be a really beautiful corridor that people could look at and be like, oh my gosh, you know, this, we did this. Yeah, that would be amazing. And as you said, it can be even bigger, the more, the better, right? <laughs> never, we will never stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's the spirit. And uh, you recently partnered with uh, Saving Nature. Can you tell me about what you're going to work on together? So, so partnering with Saving Nature has been incredibly exciting because they are the one organization that I found that has the same exact mindset and is coming at conservation from a really the correct way, I think. Um, like which rigorous is, scientific way. Yes, yes. And buying degraded land and connecting fragmented forests. That is what I've been screaming from the top of my lungs um, since I started this work <laughs> over 10 years ago. Um, you know, we can we can plant all the trees that we want, but if we're not connecting forests, if we're not creating corridors, then what are we doing? So um, with Saving Nature, we are going to work together to raise funds to buy that integral pieces of land to connect that fragmented forest on our river corridor. So it is um, a perfect partnership. Um, I couldn't be more excited to work with them. Yes, yes. I, I have very good e experience with Saving Nature. And I, I've talked to multiple um, projects that they help and, and they are doing really great work. You know, sometimes, as you said, people are just focused on planting trees, but Number one, they are not planting the right trees. Number two, they are not planting them the right way. Number three, maybe they are planting them, but they are not watering them. So, so what's the point, right? It's it's better to be efficient and focus on the places where it matters. And and um, you're you're both doing that. So uh, once this corridor is made, uh, how will it help wildlife? And it's so immense; it's hard to describe. Um, Like I said, this is the largest patch of deforestation in one of the most important forests in the world. So you can imagine the impact that it'll have. I mean, again, we use the jaguar, which is a great example. The sign of a jaguar is, a, is a, of a healthy forest. So it will create a corridor for the jaguar. It will connect indigenous land and all of the different endangered species and endemic species in that area um, that are insurmountable. Um, You know, the Darien is also a highly unexplored area. So the amount of endemism in that area alone is huge. So we plan to have a lot of different studies done on that. I mean, in that area, you can walk in and find new species, five, 10 new species, probably every day. You mean animal so, species or plant species? Animal, animal and plant species, yes. Oh. So it is um, really, really important. And again, from a global climate mitigation standpoint, from a local standpoint, I mean, also Panama's been experiencing a drought for the past three years. So it's in, it, the Darien is holding a lot of things together, not just Panama. Um, so it's very exciting. And I mean, one thing that we're also trying to do is reintroduce um, the natural uh, prey for the, for the jaguar and other species. So bringing back the capybara you know, doing rewilding. And um, this is really important. So, I mean, the forest will come back, it will connect, and it will be this beautiful example of what we can do in other places as well. Yes, yes. That sounds like an exciting plan. You Now you need to get the donors to, to help you do that. Yes, that's always the important part. And you know, it's my time is spent between Panama and New York still. 
Um, and a lot of that is because what we need to do is, is raise funds and we need to create awareness um, around this project. And what I think is really great, though, is people have a connection to it, especially if they live in the Americas. But because of the importance of this forest for the world, too, everybody can understand how important it is. So when I'm back here in New York, where I am now, when I tell this story, people can feel it. And that's what we need to do to be able to raise these funds to protect protect this forest. Unfortunately, it is urgent. We need to do it. Uh, we need to start doing it quickly to, to make sure that we can get those connections before other cattle ranchers come in or loggers come in and start to chip away at that forest even more. Yes, yes, you're totally right. And speaking of awareness raising, I noticed, um, I dare say that you're one of very few conservationists who harness the power of social media. Mm -hmm. for driving impact uh you know i i went through your instagram and i couldn't help noticing that um you're posing in front of trees in mud in sea in your workshop in a protest so um does this type of conservation model photography help you get more support for your work i would like to think so i hope so um i would say It's been, for me, I'm lucky it's been really organic with social media for me. I think I, you know, even through my artistic practices early on, I was able to gain a following, um, like I said, to create awareness about the forest. So it's been great to kind of to show people my whole story and how it's transitioned into conservation over the last 10 years. And so many people write me um, that had no idea about the forest or about conservation or trees and now they're interested and they want to be involved so it i think it definitely has a great impact and again this is it's all about exposure right we don't know the importance of this place it's it's incredible to me right so if i can use my voice and use social media as a way to get it out there that's only going to benefit the project and it it and it gives a visual to it right it's so yeah. and that's and again tying back artistic practice. It was all about trying to give people an idea of what a place looks like that they may never see in their life. That is so important to all of us. So social media can be credited to that too, is to be able to give people a vision of why it is important and why it matters. Yeah. I mean, you make conservation look so cool, you know, <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. I'm, and, I'm and, <laughs> it looks cooler than it actually is, but <laughs> especially when you are halfway um, in the mud or no, I mean, when half of your body is in mud, it might look funny on the picture, but in reality, it must be quite tough. Yes, exactly. And I mean, also filming during all of this and um, trying to even get footage. I mean, there was a big chunk of time uh, that it's so difficult, right? It's so difficult to carry equipment. Um, I've had somebody come with me in uh, the last couple of years that's been able to document this and it hasn't been easy for them. It's a lot of work. And earlier in my career, you know, we didn't have, I didn't have my iPhone with me. Like when I was in South America, especially Like I wasn't bringing my phone. So mm -hmm. there was no process to document a lot of the work that I did, even gathering the trees over the years, right? Like we just, we didn't, we were just doing the work. We weren't filming it. So it's been really cool to be able to have somebody come in there and actually get video footage and, and allow people to see it. It's been really, really great. And I give them a lot of credit. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine that the videos and photos are always better than just writing about it or, or hearing about it, right? And one of my final questions is, how do you combine your activism with artwork? Um, well, I will be honest and say that I've had to take a step back from the artwork in the last two years just because of the urgency of this corridor. But um, I think in the past, since my work is such um slow work woodworking right it's it's this slow sculptural process because of the limitations of the material is now that i'm so busy um with field work i can do a project over time and what's been really beautiful is that my artistic story has really started to naturally tie in with me as a conservationist so i feel like 
the more I get in front of people, the more I talk about this corridor, right? The artistic work is just kind of coming along with it. And that's, that's really beautiful because that's always been the intention. So even though I haven't been in my wood shop as much, um, I really feel that my pieces will have more and more meaning as this project and this area of the world becomes more known. And who's been buying your fine furniture? Who are your customers? It's always been so random and it's been mostly word of mouth. Um, so I would say that the thread between most of the people who have purchased my work is that they all are very attached to the story. They understand where the wood came from. They use it as a talking piece. And that is exactly the intention, right? Is if they know the story, if they know my story, if they know the story of the forest, then they're talking about it to other people that come into their home and see it. That's my whole intention. So that's been the thread is it's people who tend to care deeply about where this material came from. Yes. Yes. It's not just any other table. It has a story and that's, that's really beautiful. Well, thank you so much for the interview, Alexandra. You're doing great work. Where can people learn more about what you do and how to support it? Sure. So um, you can go to endangeredrainforestrescue.org. Um, I believe Saving Nature also has a page up for us now, uh, savingnature.com slash uh, Panama. And of course, check out my Instagram. Um, it's just my name at Alexandra Clement. And also the nonprofit has an Instagram as well uh, at Endangered Rainforest Rescue. But I kind of cross post between both of those accounts. So you can see all my journeys and adventures um, in doing all this work, connecting this forest. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for, for speaking with me. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. I hope this interview left you with a feeling that in spite of big challenges, we can all do something to make life better for women, nature, and the future generations. We can all be solutionaries. If you enjoyed this episode, click the subscribe button now. If you know someone who supports women's rights, who loves nature and animals, and who cares about the future of the planet and humankind, Please share Nature Solutionaries with them today. And as for you and I, we can connect on LinkedIn today. For more information, visit veronikaperkova.com. I'm Veronika Perkova, and I look forward to talking to you soon.